This weekend, we had a special race weekend. Our very own Liam Lawson finally made it to F1, and that's what inspired this video. I wanna talk about, just like how he did, I wanna talk about how drivers get to F1. Welcome to another Race Driver Coach Show. It's Enzo here, bringing you some career tips for anyone, well, for you if you're watching this, I should think, who wants to get to F1 as a driver. Because since Netflix has come along, it seems to be the latest fashion, I want to be an F1 driver. But there's certain people out there, certain subscribers to this channel that are serious. They're dedicating their life to get to F1, but they just can't seem to either get off the first step or they've been trying for a while and it's just not working. So that's what I want to talk about today because Liam Mark's the sixth driver that I've worked with one-to-one -one that's made it to F1. And actually, I've worked with 21 uh, F1 drivers either alongside in the same team as or worked with directly. And this gives me a very privileged position because I, I, you know, I get to work with them but I actually get to learn from them. I get to take and absorb and then the skills that they have and the things that actually allowed them or caused them to get to Formula One, I teach to drivers. And that's what I've been doing for, for decades now, teaching drivers how to go from where they are to where they wanna be. And it's usually to the top, right? Professional race driver status. So these drivers have shown me, this is how you do it. And that's what I wanna to communicate today really, because if you take a look at Liam, right? Look at his journey to Formula One. Now he's done his, you know, he just got, as you know, he got called in because Ricardo broke his hand and because Liam's a reserve driver, he got the call, you're in. Now, it, just, just to give you a story, an immediate story, Friday morning, we were talking in the F1 paddock and Liam was frustrated because he's like, I really want to get into F1. You know, I'm winning in Super Formula now. I'm right on the edge. I just, God, what have I got to do to tip the scale to get me in that car? And he was kind of just wondering, thinking, speaking out loud, and we were talking about it. And two hours later, Ricardo had an unfortunate accident, hit the wall, broke his hand. Liam got the call. Well, he was there already. Are you ready? Obviously, he said yes. But isn't it funny how life works? You can, you can think that you're, you're in a situation that's not great, you're so close, it's not happening, and all of a sudden life throws you a bone. And this was his. This was his bone, and he took it with both hands, took it in his mouth, and then he went into the car straight into FP3 in the wet. Not really driven this car, has he? He's been on the sim and stuff, he's not been around this track in an F1 car doesn't want to shunt, he's got everybody watching him. So he's trying to learn on the go, it's not easy. Not easy at all, then straight into qualifying. Um, and he did really good on the first set, didn't quite execute on the second set, which is pretty obvious, because he's trying to learn on all the tools on the go, in the car, how to manipulate it, how to get the right tire pressures, temp temperatures on the go while he's doing that one lap, not easy. Then he went into the race and got better and better, and to be fair, he did a really good show. He, he, he was on the pace with his teammate and he started to get into the rhythm and feel what this car's all about. So if he's in for Monza, it'd be great. But that again, just first lesson there, never give up. Especially when you, you can see, you know, you're, you're giving all your effort. You're getting similar results, you're trying different things. You, you, you think you're getting there and it doesn't quite allow you to get what you want. Just keep going, because you never know. And if you give up, it's definitely done, right? But he didn't, and I don't want you to give up either. If you think it's possible still, you chase that dream. Anyway, back to careers and how drivers get there. Now, if you look at Liam's career, he has raced in a lot of championships. So he did Formula First, Formula Ford, Australian F4, German F4, Euro Formula, Toyota Racing Series for a couple of years, FIA F3 for two years, FIA F2 for two years, DTM and Super Formula. So you can see he's raced a lot, he's been around, he's, he's had to get a lot of resources to do that, obviously a lot of help, which again we'll talk about later as one of the main things that you need to get to F1. But if you just compare his career path going to F1, so we're ignoring karting, Look at Max Verstappen. Now he went from karting to Formula 3 straight into F1. So as Liam has taken 13 or more championships 
to get to F1. Max did it in less than 13 months. So this goes to show there's not one way. There's plenty of ways, different paths of how to get to Formula One, different qualities that drivers have got. There's not a set template really. But what I wanna do here is I wanna give you some kind of template, some kind of, you need this, this, and this to be in place in order to make it, and that's what I'm gonna do. And here's five of them, so let me run you through them now. The first one, and I'm gonna get it out of the way, is money. Now when people click on this, straight away they're gonna think, yeah, you just need money and on you go, because it is an expensive sport. Yes, you do need access to cash, or somebody who's got cash, or a team, or a manufacturer that's willing to invest in you, which is cash. But it's, it's easy for people to say you need money and that's all. But let's just look at shot putting or sprinting. Let's just imagine that for these sports, you need a few mil, a few million euros, pounds, dollars to enter to compete. Does that mean that you're still gonna be good enough to get to the Olympics just because you got the money? No, you may have the money but still, you need the skill. You need to be able to do it. So if you want to be this world champion sprinter and you pay your three million to enter, doesn't mean you're going to be good enough. So everybody out there just says you need money. It takes a lot more than that because you've actually got to beat the other drivers on the grid. You've got to be good. So it is more difficult than people think. That's why it's so hard to get to the top because you need the cash side, you need the finance, and you need the skill, which we'll talk about but just understand that you're probably not gonna make it, you won't make it, if you can't get in the car in the first place because you haven't got the cash to do so, or you haven't got the opportunity. So as a driver, it's your job, or the people that are helping you, to figure out how are you gonna climb that ladder when you haven't got the cash to back you at the moment. This is the brainstorm. For a lot of drivers, what I tell them is to start in a championship that you can actually afford, a club race. Go and compete in a different country where the racing's cheaper, go there and then do well. And then you build profile and then you gather sponsors and go that way. But there is racing for pretty much everybody. You know, there's racing, some cars, I think 10, 20 grand. Anyone, any able human can figure out a way to earn about 1,600, this is pounds and dollars, per month extra to go racing. I'm sure your brain, if you could just figure out even to press record or play on this video or on this audio, you can figure out how to earn money. It's in there. So if you've got that capability, which I know you have, you can do championships that are low level, club level, but you dominate and win it. And you build your profile that way and you start your journey doing your 13 championships. Exactly what Liam did. He was in Formula First, an affordable championship. He was in Formula Ford, a semi-affordable championship as he was climbing the ranks. He had to start small. I want you to start small if you can't afford racing. But at the end of the day, you need sponsors, you need somebody to put the money behind you. Because people like, you know, other drivers are like, well, Ocon, Esteban Ocon, he didn't have the money. They were living in a caravan at one point. He's a Formula One driver and has been for a while. So just get over the fact that you just need money and figure out how can you get that money or opportunity or create a foundation that will allow you to be seen in this industry. That's up to you. Second thing you need is speed. And you know I always talk about this and I just did anyway. You've gotta be fast and you've gotta be getting the results. And going back to Liam's results, you see that he was always up the sharp end. And if he wasn't, he was still standing out. His racecraft, the way he overtook other cars, even though he was in a car that wasn't competitive, he would usually win on the very first race weekend of a new championship. DTM, Super Formula, Euro Formula, F4, he did it, all, most of them. He's gone into a championship, won in the very, F2, he did it. Won in the very first race weekend. That is arriving with a bang. So he's good at doing that. And that means he's quick. And that's what you've got to be. You can't be the sort of driver that's kind of just about top 10. You're in the top 20. And every championship you go to, you're pretty vanilla. You're pretty gray. You're not standing out. You can't have that. If you want to be an elite driver and be signed up by teams that are manufacturer based or backed or they're in the pro leagues, how are you going to stand out when you're competing 
and finishing 10th all the time. They don't want that. They need a driver like they need a, a competitive component, a gearbox. They need one that's, that works well. They need the best. And the driver that's in that cockpit is a pretty big component in the car, right? So you need that person, that individual to be very quick and to have good racecraft and be intelligent. That's what you need to work on. So if it's not happening and you're still in the double figures or you're barely in the top 10, that's probably the reason why. The third thing you need is a good reputation in the paddock. That goes without saying, right? If people are saying good things about you, they like your work ethic, they like your personality, they're more likely to give you a shot. They wanna back you. So when you've got someone who, ha who is in the industry and they can give you a leg up, they can give you an opportunity, they'll do it if they like you and they think that you deserve it. If they look at you and think, ah, oh, you're just some kind of sport brat, you don't work, you don't give all your effort, you've got terrible people skills, I can't really connect, they'll shy away from you. And if it's a manufacturer, you know, and their brand is really attached to their drivers, they need their drivers to be a certain way. They need their drivers to help them sell whatever they're selling, cars or, or energy drinks or whatever it is. So they need to pick the kind of people that help them do that. It's commercial, right? If you've got a manufacturer or a, business, a company paying for a racing team, they're thinking sales. It's all they're thinking about. They're not really thinking about, okay, we can uh, develop components that can go on the road cars and all this. No, we're thinking sales. It's a brand exercise. So we need to make sure that the people that work for us fit the brand and help us sell. Same with drivers. And that leads us into four. You've got to be politically placed. Now, to give you an example of political, because it's hard if you're not politically placed in any way to understand this, but let's just say a Mexican company sponsors a, a team, a team that you really want to race for, and they may look into motorsport and say, right, we want a top Mexican driver because we want to push our country as well as the brand and get it all aligned. They might say, right, who's the quickest Mexican driver? And they'll look around, they'll pick one, and that driver will get in front of the queue ahead of people that are outside the country or from different nationalities. And I'm afraid that's just the way it is. It's not racist or anything. Remember, it's brand, and they're thinking about the marketing side of things. And they could want somebody from a different country because they're pushing a product in there. And they know that if they pick somebody that's, say, from New Zealand, like, we really want to get into New Zealand with our product, let's get a New Zealand driver, then all the media will automatically cover that driver and we're getting free exposure. This is just what people can think like, right? So even if the driver's not great, but it's the best one of that country, he might or she might just get an opportunity. So think about now, am I politically placed in any certain way? Is there a country that I could race in and stand out more and get a bit more attention because of where I'm from? Is it my ethnicity? Anything. I'm afraid that's just the way the world works. You might get opportunities through the person you are or where you're from. And, and that's, that's politics, right? And because you've got so many brands, they might just pick you because you are the right person for them. So have a little bit of think about that because you never know. It might open a few doors. And the fifth thing is the X factor. Now this is a bonus. If you have got a good personality, you stand out. When they watch you on track, they can see that you've got something about you. You're dancing with the car. You're exciting to watch. People buy into that. It's like the Alain Prost versus Ayrton Senna. Now, Alain Prost was way more successful, right? More championships, just as fast, really. But we still talk about Ayrton Senna as being the best. We did even, even when he was alive. It's like, that's the guy. And you've got to think about why. But you start to understand the answer to that when you look at the individuals. You look at how they emotionally impacted and influenced people. The way they attacked their race, their driving style, their actual working style. If you were with Senna, you knew you are in for a rough time if he's in your mirrors. If you are with Prost, you know that's a very calculated, neat, smooth driver, which I might not have to worry about too much. He's not going to threaten me or try and take me out of the race. But when people look and, and you can see that certain drivers are more exciting, the crowd get a bit more hysterical about them, get a bit more fascinated, more passionate. Again, if you look at the boxing world, George Foreman versus Muhammad Ali, because of Muhammad Ali's character and personality. If you have 
money or backing, if you have the speed, if you've got the rep good reputation in the paddock, you've got some kind of political power and you have the X factor, I can't really see why you wouldn't make it. But I want you to look at these five areas and just score yourself out of 10 or understand where you're at with all of them. Like, have I really got the cash? If not, how can I get it? How can I get an opportunity? How can I provide an opportunity or something to a race team so they'll get me in the door if I really haven't got the money? I've got to start to think creatively because somebody's got to pay for that drive and it's 2 million euros to race F2. It's half of that, just over half of that to race F3. It's probably half of that to race F4. So we're talking half a mil. And that's a lot of cash. So you've got to think about how you're going to get the cash. If you're driving or your results are not good enough, get on it. Sort out the driving, get good results so you can start to peacock. If you're not politically placed, you're not. That's fine. Get a better reputation in the sport. Start to put yourself about. Start to have some presence. Let people know you, that you're there. All these things contribute. There's some boring ass drivers in F1, so it's not always the same. But if you do these five, if you even score six out of 10 in these five areas, you're probably gonna have a good career.